Hi. So this session is a very short introductory session to the assessment of the older person. I'm showing you, first of all, the patient assessment log so that we can um, have an overview of how we do the assessment of the older person. As you'll see, it looks pretty similar to most of the first logs that we were using, um, whereby we come in, we check the patient, uh, Dr. ABCDE, and we take history and vital signs, and then we move on to is it time critical or not. In the assessment of the old person, we're going to change that a little bit because we're going to do a GEMS assessment. Um, that doesn't mean you're assessing me, GEMS. That means that you are assessing the geriatric giants factors. You are going to do an environmental assessment. Then you're going to do a medical assessment, and then you're going to do a social assessment. Okay, so it takes um, a bit of a different approach to this. What are geriatric giants? Heard of it before? So it's basically the things that contribute to older people getting more frail. Let me show you what I mean. Geriatric giants. All right, let's move you out the way so you can see the reference. Yeah, it is old. All right, so as it says up here, these are the common features of impairment as older people begin to get frail. So the geriatric giants are made up of four different factors. First of all, frailty in itself. So as we know, as we get older, our bones get more brittle. Uh, people can suffer from osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. And we know that uh, when older people fall, it has a higher impact on them not just in terms of healing time, but there are many other things to consider too. So, for example, a person goes out, gets uh, has a fall, has a break. Quite often, that's the end of their social life. They are too afraid to go out again. So uh, bones can be easily broken and can easily affect all the other factors in a person's life. When it comes to healing time, it is a bit longer, obviously, but I also want you to keep in mind that it's much, much easier to break a bone uh, if you're an older person. So those things that you might think for a younger person, oh yeah, there's no way that the bone would be broken just because they banged into the edge of the table, uh, for example. With an older person, yeah, there is a good chance that the bone can be broken even from just a, a simple tap. So bear it in mind, don't be uh, arrogant about it. Don't think, um, don't think that just because there's nothing showing that there isn't a little hairline fracture or anything in there. They need to be checked out, unfortunately. All right, moving on from frailty, the next of the geriatric giants is uh, sarcopenia. What sarcopenia is, is muscle wastage. So as you get older, your muscles get used less and therefore they become weaker. So you're probably thinking, well, what's this got to do in, with an assessment? It's basically considering the older person who has fallen, who might not be able to get up. So most of the time, we are going to have to go and help them. Quite a lot of the time, they're not, not able to get up themselves. We do try on the phone lines. Uh, we try to sometimes get the patient to move if they possibly can. But a lot of the time, ambulance crews are called out to help a patient up. Carers quite often are not um, insured or don't feel they have the appropriate training. So you will attend a lot of calls where the old person's lying on the floor and the carers standing there staring at them. So don't judge. Um, you know, you can only do what you're trained to do or else you're negligent. So your job is to assess the patient while they're on the floor and then get them up. Sarcopenia will be affected here because they do not have the energy to push themselves up. Muscles are, aren't, aren't really working the same. So you might have to consider how you're going to get them up. A quick hoik under the armpits here, a quick bear hug, hold on to me, hold my elbows, one, two, three, hoop. That's not appropriate anymore. That's not appropriate. Think about their frailty and their bones and how that might knock something out of joint. You could easily really damage somebody by hooking them up like that. So think about the best way. Think about using your mango elk, some of your other lifting tools. Right, next is anorexia of aging. And what this is, is telling you that 
when people get older, they're not necessarily going to eat the same three meals as you and I eat. Their appetite decreases. Now, sometimes that's just natural. Uh, sometimes it's because of money, poverty, going out, uh, being afraid to go out and get stuff. It can be because they're afraid to get up to go to the toilet. So I want you to be considering, are they eating enough? Are they eating enough to have energy? Are they eating enough to keep warm? So um, asking the patient what they've had to eat uh, that day is a good tactic for this. What they would normally have to eat. You can make an assessment as to whether you believe that's enough calories to be able to freely move and operate. The next is cognitive impairment. Now we're actually going to do a few more tests on cognitive impairments in the assessment of the older person. There's three different tests you can do here. Our simple one is the mini mental test. However, there's uh, two other tests which are normally carried out by GPs that are a little bit more complex and have different scoring systems. You might have come across them if any of your parents or grandparents or anyone you know has been for an Alzheimer's assessment because it's a memory function test. So we're going to do a simplified version of that, the mini mental test. Right, let's get back to the assessment. All right, here we go. So geriatric giants, we're going to consider the whole time. We're not necessarily going to do a geriatric giant test, but some of the issues that we bring up later on in the assessment does bring that into it. Now, I think I've told you before, this is quite a long assessment. So if you do get this for your OSCE, keep it brief because it's quite hard to fit all of this into 45 minutes. So GEMS assessment, geriatric giants, environmental, medical, and social. Let's move on to environmental. So first of all, is your patient inside or outside? If the patient's outside, you've got to think about the surface that they might have landed on. You've got to think about their embarrassment, their dignity. You've got to think about when they might have last gone to the toilet. You have also got to think about things like hypothermia. So if you can do, get the patient inside the ambulance um, as soon as you possibly can safely or into their own house if they've fallen outside of their house or whatever. Um, get them in a warm, comfortable environment where they can talk freely to you and where they won't be embarrassed because dignity is a big thing for people. If you are in their house, you have different ways of assessing the environment. So first of all, what are the living conditions like? Do they live in a nice little bungalow where everything's safe? Or do they live in a, like a split level flat or house where they have to go up the stairs to the bathroom, to the bedroom, numerous times a day. That's going to be dangerous for people who are a little bit unsteady on their feet or have um, wastage of muscles or have brittle bones. So they're going to find it more and more difficult. And then when more difficulty comes with them, the increase of them falling goes up, obviously. So find out where the patient sleeps. Quite a lot of people who've got bedrooms upstairs sleep downstairs because they can't do that anymore. Now, how do you think that is for the poor patient with brittle bones and curvature of the spine sitting in a chair and going to sleep in a chair all day? They're not moving. You know, think about what illnesses can come with not moving PE. Um, think about the ongoing effects of the fact that they're living in their living room and they've got this massive house there, the heating, etc. Talking of heating, when you're in the house and you're doing your environmental assessment, I want you thinking about the temperature that the room is. Is it warm enough? If not, why not? Is this patient struggling? Do they have the horrible choice of whether to spend money on food or money on heating? Do they have double glazing? Does, is their house insulated? Um, have they got double thickness? curtains? Is their duvet big enough? All these factors are going to con contribute to hypothermia. So have a little check for that. Have a look at the surfaces. So slippery surfaces, slippery slippers make people fall. This is the worst thing ever is when you see those slippers that don't have any grips on them. This is why old people fall sometimes. So um, Quite often I've advised them, you know, new slippers with different grips, put that on your Christmas list or your birthday list or whatever it is. Um, carpet versus wood 
versus hard floor versus tiles versus lino. All these different um, surfaces can give you different type of injuries when you land on them. I want you to have a little wander into the kitchen and have a snoop in the fridge and the cupboards. So you're looking at their food and medication here. So sometimes you might see a little uh, green circle with a white square in it, a message in a bottle. If you see that on the front of the fridge, then inside the fridge, you should have a bottle that's got a script inside. So an A4 piece of paper that has the patient's name, date of birth, GP, next of kin, medication, allergies, conditions. Really, 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 really helpful if you can find the message in a bottle. If you can't, have a little look in the fridge anyway. What are they eating? Are they eating enough? Do they have food in there? No point in opening the fridge and going, yeah, I can see bread, milk, and ugh, I was going to say tuna, but let's go for tomatoes and cheese and then closing it again. No, have a little look at it. What's the date on that? You know, you'll find some people have got like milk from November last year in there. Have a look in the cupboards. Have they got enough to eat if they can't get out? Especially when COVID's going on, they're not able to get out. I want you to check their medication as well. Are they compliant with their medication? So thankfully, a lot of older people use dosset boxes. What that is, is basically um, the chemist will put their medication into a box for like morning, afternoon, evening, night, whatever, for each day of the week so that they can just pick out that box and you will know whether they're up to date with their medication by checking what was the last box taken in there. If they are compliant, that's great. Do they know what they're on their medication for? So quite a lot of the time, people won't know. If you see anticoagulants in there, alarm bells are gonna ring, especially if the patient has fallen. We all know about anticoagulants um, thinning the blood, making it more difficult for it to clot, and therefore bleeding can be going on internally throughout the body or externally, of course. Don't leave a patient at home if they have had a fall and they're on anticoagulant medication. That is a direct order, especially if there's a head injury or even a hint of a head injury. Take this patient in. Right, back to the medication. So if they're compliant, when was the last time they seen their GP? We should be having medication reviews every six months. So if this patient hasn't had a medication review for a while, they probably need to get an appointment with the doctor. While you're thinking about things like that, I want you to be looking at the care notes too, if they've got a carer. So most of the time this will come in a little blue folder and I'll be sitting in a corner of the room or whatever. You'll see the carer's notes in there. This is where uh, I used to live, leave the um, paper PRFs, the um, patient report forms, um, so that any other crews would find them. So you can have a look for some old patient records and for the activities that the carers do. So it should be listed in there how many times a day the carers are supposed to come and what their duties are. So I like to have a little read of this if it's a non-time critical um, situation. So how often are they coming? Are they coming when they're supposed to come? Do they stay for as long as they should come? Do they do all the duties they're supposed to do? So some people will have carers that are uh, there literally to come in make some food, give the food to the person and leave again. Some people are actually there to do some domestic help, to do personal hygiene, to do a washing of clothes and to prepare meals and they might be there for one hour or whatever. Is the carer doing what they're paid to do? Are they looking after the patient properly? If they're not, I don't want you to be afraid to challenge this because who else is gonna speak up for that person? I've done it numerous times. I'm not talking about confronting everyone all the time or getting into fights. I'm talking about what the patient is paying for or the government is paying for for the patient. Is that being done? If not, I have phoned up in the past the care home manager and just had a little discussion just to let them know that I didn't think that what was being done was up to standard. Um, but that's up to you, that's up to your mentors. Okay, so we've done the environmental assessment Let's move on to the medical assessment and the social assessment. We're going to do these together. So I'm just going to have a little gulp of water. You have a little read of that and don't watch me. 
Hopefully nobody's got misophonia. I, I can't bear the thought of you hearing me going, glug, glug, glug. <laughs> righto. So um, the first two things that we're looking at here come into the geriatric giants. So the skin and their mobility. So thinking about the skin, we're looking at any signs of dehydration first and foremost. Now you're going to see a lot of wrinkling and you're going to see loss of elasticity and that's normal. You will see that on all the old people. You might see age spots, liver spots, which unfortunately I've got a couple of already. I'm only like 25, but um, you will see different uh, variations on older people's skin. So you're looking out for the acne Pupura as well, and Petachai, remember those? Liver complaints from the abdominal system, sun damage. Um, you'll be also looking at, uh, uh, so the torgor. So we know about this, a little pinch of the skin here, and how quick does it take to go down? So that stays up in a tented position if the patient's dehydrated. So it will be a little bit slower than yours because the patient's lost the elasticity in their skin, but we're mainly checking for dehydration here. Moving on to check their mobility. So for this, you can do this at the end of the assessment or at the start of the assessment. At some stage, I need you to make sure that the patient is able to walk. Now, I'm sure you do this all of the time when you're leaving patients at home. If you don't, and if your mentor doesn't, I insist that you start. Think about if, this, if there's a fire that starts, how can this patient get out? We need them to be able to walk. So unfortunately, we'll have to get, get them up and get them take a little walk to the end of the room and back. You want to watch them. There are things that you're going to look out for here. So first of all, their gait, their balance. So what do they actually walk like? Are they stooped forward? Are they standing proud? Do they use anything? Let's have a look at their spine. So kyphosis and scoliosis, curvature of the spine. So kyphosis is when you have a kind of the, the arch, the hunchback, that kind of curved spine. And scoliosis is when the spine goes more into an S position. So you're kind of like, Whoa. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sure that's the old people aren't like that, but that's what the spine is, is like in scoliosis. So their motor performance, do they actually have the power to walk? Um, any loss of muscle mass, making it really difficult for them. Joint deformities, you know when you see people walk like that and you know they've got like a little hip problem or whatever, you might see them not bending their knees. You might have people that drag their feet because um, their legs are not the, the same shape as yours or eyes, mine, I mean. Um, ask them, is there any pain when they move? See if their range of movements is normal or if they're taking little shortcuts or doing things differently. If they have a walking aid, please give it to them. Don't expect them to go for a walk to the end of the room and back without it. Even if they want to, even if they're like, no, no, look at me, I don't need that. No, just let them do what they normally do. So uh, have you heard of um, sofa surfers? So these are the people that kind of hold on to various bits of furniture when they're walking. Whatever they normally do, let them. Right, so we've assessed their, their mobility and their skin. Now let's move on to the enhanced assessment. Now this is going to be really similar to your respiratory assessment that you did. So in the respiratory system, we start with the hands. We went up the arms, face, neck, IPPA and oedema. So it's a little bit like that, but after we have um, oedema, we do a mini mental test and then we do the social assessment. So this is the cognitive impairment when uh, we're in the geriatric giants. And this is the social assessment when we're in GEMS. Right, so um, hands, you know all of these things, face, lymph nodes, neck, IPPA, and then um, oedema. So with IPPA, we are expecting to hear some changes especially if the patient has COPD or was ever a smoker in their life or worked with asbestos or in the mines, anything at all, if they've been in contact with COVID patients, make sure you do a proper assessment and really listen to the lungs for as long as you want to because you will more than likely hear something or other. 
So the mini mental score, there is more about this in the PowerPoint, but with the mini mini mental score, what we're doing is we're asking 10 questions uh, or rather one statement and 10 questions. And we're going to give the patient a score out of 10. If they get eight or nine or 10, then they pass. If they get less than eight, then there's evidence of cognitive impairment. Now, this is designed to test their memory short term and long term. It's not going to work unless you make it applicable to them. So with the mini mental test, the first question slash statement is, I'm going to tell you a, a name and address. I want you to repeat it back to me and remember it. The name and address is, and for some reason it's always the same, John Smith, 42 West Street. So then they say to you, John Smith, 42 West Street. Boom, got a point already. All right, the next uh, eight questions are going to be about things that are present and things that are past. So like the short term, long term memory. So an example would be, what month is it that we're in at the moment? Who is the current prime minister? What is the disease that is a pandemic? All those current type of questions that a patient would know. Now, don't ask them things that they won't know. So for example, who won Love Island last year? Are they going to know about that? I don't think so. Things that they are going to know about that are relevant to them rather than relevant to you. So one of those things that might test the longer term memory would be, um, oh, what's your date of birth? Or, um, what was your favourite teddy called as a child? Whatever. You won't know the answer to check that one, but you'll know whether they remember it or not. What was the date of the war? Now, the thing is, there's no point in you asking them what was the date or what year the war started in if you don't even know the fact yourself. So try and figure out which questions generally work for people. You'll get a feel for it. So then once you get to the end of the mini mental test, you say, oh, what was that name and address I asked you to remember? So that will let you know whether they have retained that in that space or not. So like I say, a score of eight, nine or 10 is fine. A score of less than eight is not fine. They've got impairment. In the PowerPoint, there are two others. So there's the six CIT and the Alzheimer's test. Let me see if I can just show you these. Uh, this one. Yeah. So this. OK, the six CIT is a mini mental test. And uh, with these six questions, some of them score more, some of them score less. Basically, the maximum they can score, as in they don't get anything right, is 28. What we're looking for is them to get a score of less than eight. So you can just Google the six CIT and that will tell you what that test is. It's quite easy to remember. GPs use it. So it might be something that you want to take into practice. Uh, the, the mini mental test that we do, the 10 questions, is very flexible. The six CIT has got design, designated um, questions and answers. The next one, the GPCOG, so the cognition score, uh, that is more complex and that tests different functions of the brain. So for example, they might ask uh, the patient to count backwards. They might ask the patient to draw what does seven o'clock look like on a clock, etc. It, it's a lot more, let's sit down and do a proper assessment of your dementia or your Alzheimer's. So I wouldn't recommend uh, the GP COG, but either of the other ones, I think that's that's a good idea to take that with you on, on placement and into your work. Right, so mini mental score, really important. Now moving on to the social assessment. So we want to know what their life is like. Are they going to be suffering from uh, loneliness, isolation, etc.? Is there any type of mental issue here that we might need to be concerned about? And again, thinking about the welfare concern. So the activities of daily living, that's really important. 
So what do you do in a, in a day? So do you go out much? Do you ever go to the social club? Do you ever go and see your family? Do your family come to you? Do you have a neighbor that pops in? What are they actually doing every day? So we know that there are, unfortunately, those older people who sit in the chair all day and either look at the TV or look out the window, getting no stimulation. They're prime candidates for depression and isolation. Assess their independence or dependency. So are they reliant on family members and carers to get them shopping, to get them up and about, to get them around the house? Or are they completely independent? So we say to the patient, do you have any carers? If they say yes, we say how many times a day? What do they do? If they say no, we say, okay, well, how do you manage? You know, do you do, you do your own cooking, cleaning, etc.?" And they'll either say yes or, oh, no, I've got a neighbor that comes in or whatever they've got for that. But we need to assess whether they're dependent or not. Um, again, this came with environment, assess their diet, medication, uh, whether they might have taken too much medication, whether they are adhering to when they should do it. Uh, their type and level of social network. Are they getting out or are they in complete isolation? Now, this will be a big thing now with COVID. We got loads of people that haven't touched another human being in a year. So that is going to play on your mind, isn't it? That's going to get you really down and depressed. That might then affect their ability and desire to eat, personal hygiene, etc. Now, you think if you don't eat, then you're going to get... Um, low blood glucose levels, low energy, you're more inclined to fall, you're more inclined to get disease. If you're not washing, etc., then you're more likely to get infection. So you're um, at higher risk of getting infection, which of course leads to potential sepsis and um, can be fatal, obviously. As I said earlier, consider safeguarding and welfare. So that's it in terms of your um, older person assessment. So just to recap on that, thinking about the geriatric giants, which is um, the frailty, which is the muscle tone, which is the eating less and the cognitive impairment. We're thinking about environmental clues. We're doing a medical assessment, hands, face, neck, IPPA, oedema. We're doing a social assessment the walking, etc. Um, we are also doing the mini mental test for their cognitive assessment. All right, that's basically it in a nutshell. Um, hopefully you will take this with you and you will continue to um, do assessments in a structured manner while you're out on placements and while you're working over the summer, etc. Um, what I would suggest is that you remind yourself about our lecture in the first week, which was safety netting. So this is really poignant when it comes to leaving people at home. If you're doing safety netting, you are going to um, be making sure that there's a, a process in place in case something goes wrong. So what I mean by that is patient declines hospital, right? What are we going to do about it? We need to refer. Who are we going to refer to? So you can refer to GP, you can refer to minor injuries, you can refer to district nursing, you can refer to falls team, you can refer to um, the diabetic team, loads of places you can refer to. Do they have capacity? Get out your capacity form, fill it in. Ensure that this person knows the risks of staying at home, is able to interpret them, understand them, and is able to repeat them back to you. Complete that. Those of you who are still using paper um, patient report forms, you need to leave a copy there. Like I suggested, leave it in the care file. If not, leave it on the table. You can leave it in with the message in a bottle if you find that. Leave it somewhere where other crews will find it. When, um, when you are doing your patient report form, two sets of OBS, 20 minutes apart, now, I know there isn't a special box for it, but what I want you to do is take special care of the blood pressure. I want you to check the blood pressure on each arm. I want you to check the blood pressure sitting and standing. Okay. If a patient is on the floor when you arrive, I want you to take the blood pressure before you try and stand that patient up. Any patient who is 
unable to tell you about how they fell or how they came to be on the ground, need an ECG. Don't be lazy. Just because they've got 16 layers on doesn't mean that you get out of doing an ECG. So let's put the ECG on, print out one copy for yourselves, for your paperwork, print out one copy to put with the patient report form that you're going to leave on scene. Who are you leaving the patient in care with? If you're not leaving the patient in care with anyone, you write down when the next person is going to see this patient. So whether it's a carer or a family member, if nobody's going to see the patient, then what I need you to do is to maybe telephone a relative if the patient allows you to and um, write down on your patient report form that you have informed somebody. I want you to get the patient to sign the back of the patient report form to let you know that they understand, etc. as well. So little revisit of safety netting. It always comes up in an OSCE. Make sure you know what you're doing if you're leaving a patient at home. All right, that's the end of this session. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.